Good morning. My name is Nisha Serrano, and I have the privilege to serve as president of the Los Angeles City Employee Retirement System. Welcome to the LACERS Fall 2022 Emerging Manager Symposium. This is our third symposium, and we're excited to see so many of you joined us today. We hope that today's presentation provides you with insights that may allow you to navigate our Emerging Manager program. A little about LACERS. LACERS is a multi-billion dollar defined benefit public pension system uh, that administers retirement benefits for over 50,000 retirees, beneficiaries, and current employees of the city of Los Angeles. LACERS has a long history of working with emerging managers going back 20 years, and we understand the challenges faced when building relationships with prospective institutional investors like LACERS. The Board of Administration and staff have worked energetically to amend its investments, policies, and processes to build a reputation as a recognized leader among a handful of elite emerging manager programs. LACER seeks to build a bridge between your firm, our staff, and consultants. Today's Emerging Manager Symposium is designed to bring together experts in the emerging manager space and help sharpen your tools and allow you to compete in a level playing field. Today's symposium includes a fireside chat with Renee Griffin of, C of GCM Grosvenor, a, no a noted thought leader and influencer in investment management industry with fellow LACERS board commissioner, Jana Sidley, who will be moderating the discussion. As you hear from LACER, staff and consultants explain more about our emerging manager program and selection process. We hope that your firm will be poised to manage capital on behalf of LACERs and find today's symposium to be productive and informative. Vice President Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Serrano, for being such a huge proponent of the LACERs Emerging Managers Program. Good morning, I'm Elizabeth Lee. I'm so pleased you could join our third Emerging Manager Symposium. As President Serrano mentioned, LASERS has a total membership of over 50,000 who count on LASERS to provide a lifetime of retirement benefits. In order to fulfill this mission, we must hire the best in class investment managers with proven and verifiable track records that will allow us to protect, grow, and get the best possible investment return for our portfolio. Our board believes in providing opportunities for newer, smaller, and diverse firms to help grow our pension fund, as well as cultivating the next generation of investment manager talent. To provide this framework for this program, we adopted our Emerging Investment Manager Policy. We have a stated goal of hiring emerging managers for public markets and public markets asset classes that would generate appropriate risk-adjusted investment returns comparable to non-emerging investment managers. During manager searches, our staff, along with our consultants, conduct a rigorous selection, evaluation, and due diligence process. Your participation in today's symposium is one of the key steps in learning how you can qualify and participate in that process. Our staff and consultants are here to help you. We encourage you to subscribe to our RFP and RFI portal at www.lasers.org. With that, Please welcome our next speaker, Laser CIO, Mr. Rodney Jr. Thank you, President Lee. It's good to see uh, all of you today, and thank you for participating. Again, welcome to Laser Symposium. I am honored and excited to speak with you today about the state of Laser's Emerging Manager Program. I want to provide a sense of the progress that LACERS has made since instituting its Emerging Manager Program under a new Emerging Managers Policy that was approved by the LACERS Board in 2012. I hope by the end of the discussion that you will be convinced 
that Lacers is truly committed to working with emerging managers across every broad asset class and relying on you to help us achieve our performance objectives. My hope is that I get an opportunity uh, that you can help us build a relationship uh, so we get a chance to uh, give you the opportunity to possibly manage our capital. Before we begin the program, let's brief, briefly review the agenda for today, which is divided into two distinct program segments. Segment one is the much anticipated fireside chat with Lacers Commissioner and Investment Committee member, Jana Sidley, and our distinguished fireside chat guest, Renee Griffin of GCM Grosvenor. And then it continues with segment two that includes the emerging manager panelist discussion featuring, featuring senior level investment officers and our investment consultants in an informational discussion about LACER's emerging manager program. This should help elevate your understanding of the macro environment in which our investment program operates as well as how LACERS works with its consultants. The program will close with a message from LACERS general manager, Neil Guglielmo. While we plan to cover a great deal of information on the emergency manager program, I kindly ask that you visit lacers.org to visit our new emerging manager resource library webpage, where you will find LACERS investment policies, informational YouTube videos, the 2021 annual report on LACERS Emerging Managers, and the bios of staff and consultants. Also, the LACERS board member bios can be found on the LACERS website under the board tab. I also encourage you to sign up for LACERS RFP and RFI subscription service while you are visiting the resources page to ensure that you are one of the first to know about the release of LACERS investment RFPs and RFIs. Okay, let's get started. I am pleased to provide the State of LACERS Emerging Manager Program. So LACERS began working with emerging managers approximately 20 years ago when LACERS launched its initial Emerging Manager Program that started with several hundred million dollars that were deployed between 2003 and 2010. We then paused for about a year so that staff and consultants could rework its emerging manager program to be more effective and relevant based on changes and growth in the emerging manager community. In 2012, the program was relaunched under a new vision, one that built an emerging manager portfolio that had greater alignment with achieving long-term risk-adjusted returns with an emphasis on greater efforts to outreach to emerging managers. This was accomplished under a revised EM policy that em emphasized manager performance. I would now like to walk you through several indicators of progress we have made in reaching a greater number of EMs over the past nine years. As you can see, EM manager growth has been consistent since 2013. And we now count 34 emerging manager commitments on LACERS roster. Moving to the next chart, LACERS also increased its dollar exposure to EMs across public and private market managers, as depicted in this bar chart diagram from 2013 to September 30th of 2022. I, I uh, believe you can see some uh, consistent growth here as well in terms of the dollars that we are getting out the door. Since the restart of the program in 2012, LACERS has invested and committed over $925 million to EMs. Thus far in 2022, LACERS has committed over 100 million to private equity EMs, and we anticipate identifying several additional real estate EMs that meet our criteria. For our public market equity and fixed income portfolios, the next manager search cycle begins in 2024. So stay tuned as LACERS and its general consultant will begin working hard to broaden our reach to more EMs in the public market space. Moving to the next slide, 
Let's take a look at EM exposure on a percentage of dollar basis as depicted in this bar chart. Again, you'll see growth from 2013 to September 30th of this year. Uh, we have about 4.6% of our uh, dollars of lasers committed to the EM space. I am proud to present a chart that reflects continual growth in the percentage of EM exposure. You will notice, of course, a slight dip in 2021, but that was largely due to the fast expansion of total asset growth in that year. And by the way, 2021 was a Lacers banner performance year with a net return of 29.09% for our fiscal year ending June 30th of 2021. But despite the progress that we have made, we want to increase our exposure to EMs in the future. The next slide provides a broad overview of our EM exposure across the entire Lacers portfolio, broken down by broad asset classes. The blue line that you see is our US equity. The sort of reddish orange line is our non-US equity exposure. Private equity is depicted in the gray line and private real estate in sort of that mustard yellow color. As you can see, real estate is one asset class that we do need more emerging manager participation. New for 2023 is our private equity or private credit asset class that was approved by the board in 2018. This will be yet another opportunity asset class for EMs to compete. While EM asset class exposure levels reflect an upward trend by policy, Lacer's expectation is to place no less than 10% of its capital with qualified EMs. The charts we have reviewed reflect satisfactory progress since 2013, but we are still short of our desired EM exposure, which means my staff and I, along with our investment consultants and with support of the board, have challenging work ahead of us. We believe that placing capital with EMs is a key driving factor in helping Lacers meet its performance objectives. We are constantly reviewing our emerging investment manager policy and program and have made recent changes to embrace greater inclusivity of EMs, even launched research efforts in 2021 that will help Lacers better target our own outreach efforts with traditionally underrepresented groups in order to increase Lacer's touch points with EMs. In the first nine months of the calendar year of 2022, staff met with a record 124 EMs using virtual meeting platforms, not to mention the efforts put forth by our three consultants. I continue to direct my staff to, and team to meet with EMs uh, beginning with uh, through virtual means, of course, but going forward, meeting in person at Lacer's new headquarters building in downtown LA, starting in early 2023, at approximately, um, and we also try to meet emerging managers at approximately a dozen uh, emerging manager conferences nationwide. Further, I am. Encouraging our investment consultants to cast a wider net, to capture more EMs in their respective selection programs, and to take meetings when appropriate. Lacers pays well over $1 billion in retirement and health benefits each year to its retirees and beneficiaries. We need the best investment managers on our team to help us deliver on those retirement promises. We encourage your firm to compete, to be a member of our investment manager stable and help us drive our performance upward. My team and I look forward to working with you in the future. Let me take this moment to thank our entire board of administration under the leadership of President Serrano for being very supportive of LACER's Emerging Manager Program. At this time, we are going to shift gears and head into the fireside chat. Before we do so, I want to properly introduce both moderator and our distinguished guest. Let me start first with our moderator, 
Janice Sidley, who is a Lakers Board Commissioner and serves on the Investment Committee. She was honored to serve as the first female general counsel for the Port of Los Angeles for over nine years. Ms. Sidley's career with the city of Los, city of Los Angeles be, began in 20, uh, excuse me, 2003. In addition to her work with LA, she serves as a commissioner of the California Milton Marks Little Hoover Commission on California State Government Organization and Economy, appointed in 2016 by Governor Brown and reappointed by Governor Newsom. She was honored in 2020 as a member of Lawyers of Distinction and in 2019 received a Leader in the Law Award from the Los Angeles Business Journal. She holds a Juris Doctor degree from Loyola Law School and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of California, Berkeley. Our fireside chat guest is Renee Griffin, who I have known for many years. Renee is a thought leader and an influencer with over 35 years of experience, driving change, expanding opportunities, access, expanding inclusion in the investment manage management industry by helping to build relationships and forging alliances between participants in the investment industry. In 2017, Renee began, joined GCM Grosvenor, a global alternative investment management firm. She is a managing director responsible for strategic uh, relationships and development, business development, growth of the firm's small and emerging and diverse manager investment platform, where she also serves on the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Prior to joining GCM, Ms. Griffin was CEO of RG and Associates, a consulting firm she founded and managed for 17 years pioneering the first and long running educational conference focused on emerging and diverse asset managers, helping thousands of minority and women business enterprises gain exposure and access to capital both domestically and internationally. Ms. Griffin has been recognized by the Network Journal as one of the 25 most influential black women in business was awarded the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Madam C.J. Walker Entrepreneur of the Year Award and the National Association of Investment Companies Trailblazer Award. She is a graduate of the University of San Francisco and holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics. I am excited to be part of the Fireside Chat audience. So without further ado, I pass the symposium over to Jana. Well, Rod, thank you very much. And uh, President uh, Serrano and Vice President Lee, I wanna thank you for your leadership uh, on this emergency manage on Emerging Managers program. And uh, I welcome today, uh, Renee Griffin. And Renee, it's gonna be a pleasure to have this fireside chat with you. And I will start, first of all, let me apologize, all best plans. I now have somebody doing some work outside my window of a hotel room. so. If it's loud, my apologies up front. Uh, I did move my seat, hoping to uh, dull the noise a little bit, but you may still hear it in the background. So uh, with that, I start, uh, obviously, Renee, with your extensive background, which Rod has just gone through, and it is oh so impressive. Um, I really want to go through specifically your working with emergence, emerging managers in the last 30 years. Please tell us how you entered the uh, investment management industry and how you began working and focusing your efforts on emerging managers. Thank you, Jana. I've been looking forward to this uh, talk we're about to have. We're gonna have a great time, but I do have to first thank uh, you and the president and the, the board chair, and of course, my good friend, Rod June and his investment team for this opportunity. It is truly an honor and I'm super excited. So. Let me um, <laughs> let me answer your question just to uh, give you a little bit about my background. I like emerging managers. I think I was a little visionary growing up in Fresno, California during the '60s and '70s, and it was an era when you know fighting for social justice and economic justice was just whirling all around me. Um, I, at the time, I was I was bused to a 
a predominantly white school where I faced discrimination on a daily basis. I knew I had to work harder, be a little smarter, and the pressure was on to really prove myself. So it was okay. I was an athlete. I was pretty competitive, strong-headed, and hell-bent on just smashing through some of the stereotypes. So uh, fast forward, I started this career in finance, and I, I brought that passion and that desire for change with me. So then I joined uh, Progress. Um, investment management company in the 90s. And Progress was really a pioneer of the manager of manager, emerging manager space. So I got a chance to really apply some of that passion towards helping emerging managers. And fun fact, fun fact, my very first LP meeting was with Lasers 26 years ago. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so absolutely. That is, that is so <laughs> That is wonderful. <laughs> yes. And and during that time in the 90s, it was when pension plans were also establishing emerging manager programs around the country in California, in New York, Connecticut, and, and other states. And so those programs were a feeder for diverse manager capital. And, you know, we all know what happened when Prop 209 hit California. There could no longer really be a consideration around gender and ethnicity as it relates to state agencies, applying that to hiring practices. But, you know, we, we pressed on during that era. There were a lot of folks advocating for change, and I was one of them. But I was watching what was playing out in California, and I was really seeing that sort of um, percolate around the country where without mandates and real, you know, policy in place, some of those commitments that were being made started sort of dwindling over time. So I said, Houston, we got a problem here. <laughs> and I, I believe that either you're a part of the problem or you're a part of the solution. So I launched RG and Associates and Rod touched upon a consortium, the educational conference that um, I founded back in 2004, but what I would say about that is that it really took a, a, a community. Uh, Lasers was involved. We had industry partners like Towego and NAIC that were very instrumental in the growth and the impact of consortium. Now it sits on um, Grovner's platform where I am today. And I'm so honored and humbled that you know, almost 20 years, which we'll celebrate next year, that I still get to do this work, even at Grosvenor, where, you know, we are focused on impact too, because Grosvenor gets it. Um, and I, I will say this, uh, investing with small emerging and diverse managers is our sweet spot. Of our 73 billion, we've allocated, I think about 15 billion to emerging and diverse managers, or I should say small and emerging managers and another 2.2 billion with diverse. So I say that to say that that's where we're seeing the quality, that's where we're seeing the opportunity, and that's where we're seeing our performance. So the case is there to um, invest with emerging managers. And why it's important to me is for all the reasons I've mentioned, you know, being a woman, person of color, um, being underrepresented, undervalued, misjudged, like many emerging managers, many diverse managers, all we need is an opportunity, an opportunity to display our talents, our perspectives, and uh, really show what we can do in the marketplace. Renee, thank you for that. And, and thank you for your continued dedication. And I want everybody who's listening today to understand, Lasers is here to give you a chance. Renee is here to, to give you a chance. Believe that the chance is out there. And um, I think that the rest of this conversation will continue to prove that point. But I just wanted to emphasize, Renee, what you just said. It's so important to hear that and to hear you and others in your position are, are working so hard to keep this passion alive. And so um, just a personal thank you as we move on to um, question, my question two, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about diversity and how this awareness of diversity seems to be replacing and reshaping the investment ecosystem. 
Why is diversity so important in managing broad, economically diversified, tool diversified investment portfolios? And has there been enough progress to take place? I'll answer quickly, no. Um, and what else needs to be done, please, to help you know, move everybody so they understand the importance of diversity? Jenna, I will start with saying without diversity, the investment ecosystem would collapse. And uh, I think, you know, we've proven and you've proven that diversity is critical to our industry survival. So I'll just start there. But here's why I say this. Uh, just imagine, right, if all LPs had their assets in public markets with little or no diversification in any other asset class. And then there was a sharp downturn in the equities market like we're seeing today. The livelihood, the livelihood of millions of beneficiaries and stakeholders would be at risk. And I think, you know, bells would be going off and potentially heads rolling because asset class diversification is so important. And we know that it's critical to creating that balanced risk adjusted portfolio. So if that is the case, as it relates to asset class diversification, shouldn't there be manager diversification? Managers of all types, all sizes, because, I mean, it's clear that managers of different genders, ethnicities, backgrounds really bring unique ideas, perspectives, and opportunities that often um, some of the bigger managers don't get to tap into. So they can fill in the gaps, the holes in the portfolio. And so, I, you know, I don't know if performance is the concern that a lot of LPs have because we're really seeing a lot of data in the marketplace around the potential of emerging managers to outperform and at least be at par. I mean, you've heard the reports, right? The Knight Foundation has produced many, NEIC has produced many. Even at Grobner, we recently put out a thought piece on diverse manager investing. So the information's out there. I just think if fiduciaries are investing in a homogenous group of managers, then they're potentially putting the risk of their performance at stake. And I think the same alarm should go off and heads should roll. Well, I mean, just when you studied in college and when whenever you're preparing, you want to get information and ideas from all different places in order to make thoughtful, informed decisions. And as a fiduciary uh, for Lacers, I feel like I'm not doing my job correctly if I'm not sweeping the universe for ideas and thoughts. And that includes everybody. And so the very essence, I see I'm frozen, but um, the very essence of diversity is everybody has a stake in this decision That's making. Right. Everybody's at the table. So it, it's fundamental, I think, to making good informed decisions to support all of those people that are relying on lacers for their pension, for their benefits. And so uh, I think that as Rod has described and, and certainly also President Serrano and Vice President Lee, it is in our DNA and it is in, in how we uh, broach all of our decisions is to make sure that we have all of the information from all of the different sources in order to make good informed decisions. So I can't, I that. Renee, I can't agree with you more about what you're <laughs> saying. And we just need to clone you, Jana. <laughs> we need to clone you and the Lacers, you know, organization and, and make you guys a blueprint because we really need that attitude in the marketplace to really bring around the changes that we need to see. So, you know, just to answer the other part two of your question around has enough progress been made? Some would say yes, some would say no. And, you know, I reflect on a uh, report that my colleague produced, uh, Peter Brockman, he does this amazing LP presentation on the state of the emerging market every year. And I, I was reading it and some of the stats he indicated was that over the last 12 years, 
50%, 50 of all the funds raised have been raised by emerging managers. And diverse managers, I mean, they've raised funds threefold since 2019 through 2021 uh, compared to 10 years ago. So there are plenty of emerging managers coming into the market. The problem is when you look at the, the data, over those same 12 years, and you look at the capital that's coming to the market, there's been a steady decrease in the amount that's been allocated to emerging managers versus established managers. And therein lies the problem, right? So despite the growth right, that we've seen of capital, there's less being given to uh, emerging and diverse managers. And we all know that number that 71 trillion dollars and only 1.3 percent being managed by um, diverse managers and when you put that into perspective because i thought about this and i said well wait a minute the earth is about a trillion meters from the moon that means white guys get to take 70 trips to the moon whereas <laughs> diverse managers get to take one trip and then they can go a third of the way and then they have to turn around and come back. So <laughs> I'm trying to add a little levity to this, but there is nothing that should make us feel good about that. No, the, the analogy is important. I think, you know, if we put things in different perspectives, sometimes people hear it differently. Uh, people are different types of learners. Uh, some yeah. are better reading, some are better orally. And so giving different examples, I think, is very powerful. And, you know, again, to the, to the point, people need a chance and you need a chance to make it all the way to the moon. And then you can make it to the moon the second time, but you got to get there. You know, <laughs> gotta so. get there. <laughs> so. But in terms of what could be done, you know, you and I touched upon this a little bit. You know, I think about the myth about the uh, Loch Ness Monster. It's a myth, right? And there are myths certainly associated with emerging managers like, you um, they tend to have no real experience or uh, investing with them, you're taking a higher risk or that they underperform most established managers. But as I said, we're seeing something different at Grosvenor. We're seeing high quality managers quite often who are spinning out of large, or larger organizations and you know, becoming top quartile performers. And the key is getting into them early because sometimes it's tougher to access them later. And that's the value of investing with emerging managers. And, and, and can you know, I make one more point really please, real quick? Because I, I want to just, and these aren't the views of Grovner, right? And I might get in trouble, but I do think that fiduciaries should ask themselves some really tough questions like, you know, is my portfolio vulnerable, right? If the majority of my assets are managed by a homogenous group. Another question is, am I maximizing performance opportunities? If not, is that in the best interest of my benefactors? And then the last, this one's really tough, you know, do I believe in the statistics? Do I believe that diversity uh, generates out performance, or do I need to look at my potential explicit biases and whether they're affecting my decision-making process as a fiduciary? And those are questions I think have to be asked, you know, sort of internally. But, you know, I feel strongly that once we see diversity in every nook and cranny of our industry, that's when we'll see real transformative change and we'll all be able to participate and thrive. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I do think, I mean, our numbers at Lacers bear out that investing in emerging managers, uh, the returns are uh, similar, if not better. Uh, and we are fiduciaries and we have to always look at returns. And yeah. Um, you know, they're there. And so uh, we, you know, that's the bottom line and they're, and they're clearly they're there. So let me move on, Renee, to question three. And um, the investment industry has, the uh, landscape has changed tremendously since 2019. What are some of the trends and even the headwinds that emerging managers are facing? I think we've touched on some of this, but we'll go through it. Um, how do you successfully fundraise, 
Oh goodness. Um, <laughs> me, uh, the problems of having your cell phone tied to all of this. Um, uh, me. I can, I can answer these. Oh, I, go ahead. <laughs> I can, I get, so, <laughs> and you know, I recently read uh, or listened to the Steve job podcast. I'm sort of a podcast junkie <laughs> and I've read the presentation skills uh, or secrets of Steve jobs. And he said, People only remember two to three points at a time. And there's a lot packed into this question. So I'm going to try to keep my comments sort of succinct. So as it relates to trends, um, we are seeing a positive increase in corporations, endowments, foundations, family offices, focusing on DEI. And that's been, you know, sort of over the last three years where we've seen, a, seen an increase. Uh, so that's one. Trend. We're also seeing where LPs are taking more creative approaches to investing with emerging managers, either through joint ventures, some are anchoring, seeding, taking GP stakes, and, and upping it, uh, their co-investment strategies with emerging managers. Um, another area that's pretty interesting, we're seeing some LPs allocate capital specifically to diverse managers who are investing in diverse entrepreneurs. And that's happening a lot on the venture side, where we're definitely seeing that group of managers uh, grow. And we're seeing more women, women-led funds being launched. So those are all very awesome and positive things. But in terms of headwinds, where there's tailwinds, quite often headwinds follow. And, you know, based on the surge that we've seen in the marketplace of more emerging managers coming into the space, the competition is fierce, right? We're also seeing, you know, some anti-ESG, a little DEI backlash in some states that are pushing for that. Uh, but they're getting pushed back on as well. And we don't know where this will all sort of roll out over the next uh, you know, year or so. But I, I say keep an eye on that. Um, I also think you know, we're all talking about the market and market conditions and high interest rates and uh, the rising rate of inflation, the denominator effect, which I know the, the next... Um, discussion will be focused on, but that's causing real scarcity in the marketplace for, for capital, uh, for emerging managers, because many LPs are considering reducing their managers or only re-upping with the managers they know. So, you know, in terms of what could managers do, I know you were touching upon that. Um, I say you got to be the captain at the helm of the ship, looking out with your binoculars, right? And keeping the vision, keeping the vision. And here's some ideas. Um, my, my colleague, Peter, touched upon this in his presentation. He said, have plenty of operating capital on hand that you need at least like 6 million if you're launching, just to make it through these tough market cycles, um, to endure those fun, uh, fundraising cycles and slower launches. Another uh, area of focus that you really should pay attention to is having a strong marketing plan because you know now it's tougher as we know to raise capital. So make sure you're targeting the right LPs that suit your strategy, suit your size, you know, at the growth, the growth stage that you're in. And if you don't have the internal marketing expertise, hire a placement agent if you must. That person can serve as your GPS system, have you, you know, avoid the pitfalls, the road closures, and help navigate a, a sort of shorter route to closing your fund. And then work with consultants. Consultants are there um, as you know, fiduciaries as well, find out if they have discretion, find out if they're just in advisory roles, but either way, their role is important. And then the last thing I would touch upon, and this is, you know, something I noticed when talking with some managers, because they'll talk with me, then they'll go talk with, 
some of my team members and they'll reach out to the president. It's like, identify the key decision makers, but don't circumvent them. That, you know, you're sort of stabbing yourself in the foot. So, um, and then I do think you got to get your name out there, being involved with organizations like NAIC and NAA and AIM and NASP and PEWIN, gosh, so many, Reese, IDAC, Tide, SEO, Twigo. These organizations are there to support you. Get involved, you know, brand visibility, thought leadership really sets you apart. And then the last point, and I know I'm sort of going on on this one because it's just so much that I've <laughs> sort of captured over the years and I've learned from managers that I've met with or observed, um, be relationship focused, not transactional. That's sort of important. One of my um, mentors, Mark Skazanov, who founded Progress, <laughs> once said to me, um, when you meet a person in our industry, they really don't want to know who you are. They want to know how much you know about them. So do your homework, ask questions, identify the LPs uh, needs and their problems, and then offer solutions. Because, you know, remember a no today could be a yes tomorrow. So keep the relationships warm. So I know that was a mouthful, but I just no, Renee, to it's important that. Your, your mouthful. First of all, 30 years of experience. I mean, you have so much to share and it's so important to hear from people like you in this area. So, um, you know, you going on and, and giving these robust answers is, is so important. I want to, I, and, and definitely knowing who you're talking to is such good advice. Uh, not just in this area, but in anything you're doing. Know who you're talking to because it will serve you well. Um, I also want to add, you mentioned the pushback on ESG. I ask people, watch what's going on in California. The governor today, there is an article where the, uh, Governor Newsom just talked about how um, it is the wrong way to go and states are going to suffer that are pushing back on ESG investing, it goes back to the point that you and I, Renee, have made about mm -hmm. informed decisions. And if you start pushing back on, on certain things, you're not going to be making informed decisions. You're going to be making decisions with half the information that you need. So yeah. um, I do recommend continuing to watch uh, California, who is a leader uh, and wants to continue to be a leader. So. Um, with that, go ahead and move on to the <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to uh, try to find that on uh, Twitter, I guess, or somewhere. I am sure that uh, we can probably put it uh, out. It's, it's in the clips today. I get clips as a commissioner, and it was in the clips today from uh, Governor Newsom and, and talking about this point. So, um, awesome. you know, and we'll, we'll see if I can get the name of the article. But That's anyway. one of the reasons I missed being in California, by the way, it's all those, you know, uh, California is still carrying the torch, right, around diversity and, uh, you know, folks like you and others that are there, since I'm no longer there, you know, have to continue to fight the good fight. And, and Renee, I mean, we're the fourth largest economy in the world, and yeah. we're a leader, so that is important. Like if we were doing something wrong, we wouldn't be the fourth largest economy. So again, this diversity of ideas and concepts, it's, it's proving out to be the right path. And so I'll stop. <laughs> I know People the choir preaching to the choir. <laughs> we're singing the same song here, Jana. I love it. And we're in yeah. harmony too. We sound good. <laughs> Let me just, let me ask another question. Um, based on some of the trends and challenges that you've just discussed, how would you advise invest, investors who are seeking to begin investing in emerging managers and or how would you advise those who um, with robust uh, emerging managers programs to continue? What is it that we need to continue to do or if you want to get started, uh, what should we be doing? Well, you know, I'm not one to boss LPs around, but <laughs> I will I will just point out a couple things. I, I think we have to remind ourselves that every manager was once an emerging manager, 
right? That includes BlackRock and KKR and T. Rowe Price, Vista, Apollo, Clear Lake. They all started um, small. They all were newly born. They were all, they all had limited track records, right? But see where they are today. So I think for LPs, look, tap the talent. I call it TTT, tap the talent and get in early. There's what, five to 700 emerging managers entering the market each year. So they're out there. Um, the other thing I would, would offer to say is, you know, establish higher and clearer emerging manager allocation goals for 2023. Be explicit. Um, one of the foundations, Kresge Foundation, had established a 25 by 25 focus on diverse managers. That meant that a minimum, not where they would cap it, but a minimum of 25% of their assets would be placed with diverse managers by 2025. I think that's clear. Um, I think it's also important to have these policies embedded into your organization, institutionalize it, and bring those practices across the organization, across the investment teams. Um, I think you have to set metrics and reporting standards and, you know, real, really have some accounting, accountability measures for your consultants and your teams. I think that's critical. Um, this may not apply to all LPs and I've sort of changed my stance on this over time, but I think we do have to go back to considering establishing separate pools of capital. Now, some may really argue that, but I have seen in pre, you know, in the early years where those separate pools were really, you know, putting money out there. And, you know, again, this is, doesn't apply across the board, but some plans that have just sort of said, we're going to incorporate it in, just haven't necessarily seen that happen. So I think you have to examine your organization, see what's the best alternative, but I'm all for, let's just make some targets, let's set aside some capital, because that way, the emerging managers are not competing for the capital that's in that bigger uh, bucket. Um, I also think if you don't have the internal um, capabilities or, or bandwidth, um, hire a partner, hire an expert that's skilled and who can help you weed through and harvest the emerging manager talent. It's what they do every day. So take advantage of that if you need that support. Um, and the last thing I would touch upon is that I think diversity increases diversity. So if you look back in history where a lot of those um, programs were launched is because there were women, there were people of color, and, and not exclusively, but there were real advocates that were saying, this is important, this needs to happen, we're missing out on opportunities. And it was that diversity uh, that costs a lot of the uh, focus on inclusion. So I say LP should look across their own organizations and their boards and make sure that they're gender um, and uh, ethnically diverse. Thank you for that. And I, again, I'm putting my, my mic on mute because I still have quite a bit of construction going on outside my window. But um, let me ask you another question about uh, many emerging managers. They get their initial mandates through, as you've mentioned, a manager of managers or a fund of funds. And what advice would you provide to emerging managers to better position themselves for direct mandates? Well, first of all, I think, you know, and everybody hears this, I'm not, I'm really not sharing any new news. I'm just trying to maybe say it in a different way, but you really do have to check off all the boxes. You have to have a strong team. You have to have a tight back office uh, to manage the growth ex expectations. Um, performance has to be there. Um, LPs are looking for scalability. They're looking for, you know, you to have a strong pipeline of deals, particularly on the private market side, like, you know, they want to know that if they give you more capital, that you're going to put it to work in the, the most um, 
sort of efficient, productive way. So that's key. And then I think, you know, don't rule out the help of fund of funds who can just sort of guide and direct you because I think that, you know, quite often managers don't look for leads from LPs, but at Grosvenor, we spend time trying to consult with our managers, making sure they um, are getting the right exposure, even if we can't write a check with them. So I think, you know, you got to identify to the, the type of LPs that have transition programs. There are some out there. I don't know if that's something you do at Lacers, but you know, for managers that can get into their emerging manager programs, quite often they're looking for ways to grow them outside of that pool of capital. And I'd also say that really focus on, you know, some of the smaller allocators who don't mind going in directly because they can write those smaller checks, such as family offices and endowments and foundations. Oh, Renee, we, um, we're getting close to the end. And I want to ask, I, I know, we, could, we could chat all day, but um, I want to actually ask one last question, but, but I'm going to broaden my question a little bit to say to you, I want to give you the opportunity to address emerging managers that are listening today. If we've missed anything that you feel is advice that, that they should be hearing that we haven't touched on, and also actions that they should be thinking about for resiliency and flexibility as we touched on. It's a challenging economic time. Um, so just a broad sweeping question of what would you like to share in your opportunity here with those that are listening? Well, um, thank you, Jana. <laughs> I'll try not to repeat myself, but... What I would say, and I say this respectfully to all the managers, regardless of your size uh, and level of expertise, have your S-H-I-T together, okay? And S stands for strategy. Uh, have a clear roadmap on how you're gonna scale your firm. Um, really have a refined investment thesis that's unique and compelling. That's what LPs are looking for in terms of, you know, managers that can fill certain voids in their portfolio. And also, I would suggest soft circling capital before you launch. Make that a part of your strategy to make sure that you're launching with some potential clients uh, in the horizon. Um, H stands for high quality. Uh, have a cohesive team. We talked about that. But make sure, I think, from the senior all the way down to junior levels, that your teams are diverse, not with just, you know, one ethnicity either, or just with, you know, same ethnicity and, and different gender, but across your organization, make sure it's diverse. And then have a solid back office and operational expertise that will give you that high quality stamp of approval. And then the I stands for impact. Focus on performance. I know that's why we're here. Perform, 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 right? But also, you know, I think we're in a time where LPs are looking for impact. So make sure you can describe your investment impact, not just the performance uh, impact, but your impact on the environment, communities, um, the people um, that you serve. Because this, again, is becoming more and more important to LPs. And then um, T stands for tenacity. Uh, be an ankle biter, but don't draw blood, okay? <laughs> and, you know, learn to welcome a no, you know? I always used to say that a no is just paving the way for the yeses. So just keep that in mind. And then you know, I've always been driven by passion. I say, let your passion drive you, not money. Uh, your passion will naturally, naturally drive your success. And then, you know, the last thing I would say as I reflect on, you know, I do my morning reflection. And this morning I was just thinking about faith and I would just say, keep the faith because emerging managers are visionaries. 
You've launched your firms with the vision that despite the odds, which we know are out there, that you will be successful at creating exceptional value for your um, investors and, and team members and family, right? And I felt that way when I left Progress Investment Management and started RG and Associates. People absolutely thought I was crazy, and maybe I was, but I had a vision <laughs> and I had faith. And so, you know, one of my favorite um, scriptures, and I'm paraphrasing, is faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of the things you do not see. So I would just say, keep the vision, right? Put on your raincoat when you go out in the storm and then sharpen your teeth because you're going to need to bite a bunch of ankles. <laughs> <laughs> to survive. And, and I feel positive. I, you know, I really want to leave us with this is that in spite of all the challenges that we face in this industry, there has been growth. And with all of us working together, like the work you're doing at Lasers and other LPs and the high quality talent that we're seeing in the marketplace, we're going to win. We're going to win. So. Well, Renee, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. And I will say your tea probably comes from the fact that you were an athlete. Um, and so it's a long time there. Congratulations. And I, I appreciate the advice that you've given to everybody who's joining us today. Uh, and for me as well, just hearing it, it's, uh, it's so important that we continue to talk about these issues. And so, uh, that will conclude our fireside chat for today, but it was a pleasure and uh, thank you again. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Jana. Let's take our uh, show on the road, okay? <laughs> you and I. <laughs> and thank as long you, as it's God. warm, wherever we're going, as long as it's warm, I'm in. <laughs> okay, take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Rod, I think back to you, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you so much. That was an incredible fireside chat. And I hope for the EMs out there that you listened carefully and took a lot of good notes. Again, thank you, Dan and Renee. It was just very thought provoking. Um, and you gave a good, uh, I think, good background on the current state and the future of the emerging manager community. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn the program over to LACER staff moderators, Brian Fujita, Chief Operating Officer and Head of the Public Markets Portfolio, and Wilkin Lee, Director of Private Market Assets. Uh, and together they will lead the discussions with the LACER's investment consultants. So uh, Brian and Wilkin, I turn it over to you now. Thank you, Rod, and good day, everyone. Again, I'm Brian Fujita, Chief Operating Officer of the Investment Division, here with my co-moderator of this panel, panel, my esteemed colleague, Wilkin Lee. So in the previous discussion, Commissioner Sidley and Renee Griffin really honed in on how emerging managers and investors in general might adapt to the current trends and challenges in the market. In this panel discussion, we're gonna drill down specifically to how laser staff and investment consultants are thinking about the markets. The challenges and opportunities current market conditions present to Lears' portfolio and how emerging managers might best approach us to build relationships in light of these factors. We're going to start off with some brief introductions of moderators and panelists. I'll start off followed by Wilkin, Carolyn, Jeff, and Felix in that order. Uh, let's try to keep our introductions to one minute or less to focus more of our, our time on discussing uh, today's panel topic. So again, I'm Brian Fujita, Chief Operating Officer of Investments. I also head the Public Markets Investment Team, which consists of four extraordinary investment officers, Barbara Sandoval, Ellen Chen, Jeremiah Padas, and James Wang. I've been with Lacers since 2010 and in my current role since 2013. And I'll hand it off to Wilkin. All right, thanks, Brian. So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Wilkin Lee. I'm the Director of Private Market Assets for Lacers. Uh, I've been with the organization for almost nine years now, and I manage the private equity, private real estate, and private credit asset classes. So Lasers has a very uh, mature private equity markets portfolio that's well diversified across many different strategies. But the good news is that we're always looking to deploy capital uh, to emerging managers, and we're very excited to have you on the line today. Uh, prior to joining Lasers, I worked at a global macro fund in Pasadena called First Quadrant. I had various stints working at Goldman Sachs in New York City and also J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley in San Francisco. Uh, I'm privileged to work with a very talented team of three other investment officers. 
uh, in the private markets division, and they are Eduardo Park, Robert King, and Clark Hoover. So if you ever bump into them at emerging manager conferences, don't be afraid to say hi to them. So I'll pass it off to Carolyn. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Smith, and I'm a partner and generalist consultant with NEPC. I'm located in our San Francisco office, and I've been with NEPC since 2006, but I've spent the last 35 years providing investment consulting services to institutional investors very similar to LASERS. I've worked with LASERS since 2017 as their generalist consultant. And I'll pass it off to the next person. Jeff? Yeah, hi, Jeff Goldberger. I'm a managing director at Axia. Axia is a, a global, global firm covering US, Europe, Asia. Um, we work across all asset classes from you know, hedge funds to, to private equity. Um, I started with the firm in 2007, so going on about 15 years at this point. Prior to joining Axia, I worked in the public markets for a you know, hedge fund mutual fund shop where I was an analyst you know, for, for mid cap companies. I currently lead the research and coverage of buyout funds in the U.S. middle market, uh, managing a team of approximately five to six people. Um, and I also work with a, a number of different clients, in particular, um, you know, working with Lacers and, and helping to build their private equity portfolio. Um, and just quickly, special thanks to Lacers board, President Serrano, Rod, staff, everybody for uh, continued focus on the, on the emerging manager space. Um, and for putting on the symposium. And Felix. Hi everyone, I'm Felix Fels. I'm an associate partner with the Townsend Group um, and Townsend has been Lasers real estate consultant for the past eight years. I personally have been with the firm and working with Lasers for seven of those years. So we advise Lasers on all things real estate from strategic planning to manager selection uh, and portfolio management and monitoring as well. So let's start the discussion by talking about the macro environment. We're currently in the early stages of a new market regime characterized by high inflation, higher rates, and overhanging fears of a recession. Volatility in the public markets has been uh, extremely high, while investment valuations are trending downwards from the peak levels uh, reached last year. Since the beginning of this year, the LASIS portfolio has fallen from an all-time high of $24 billion to about $21 billion currently with most of that decline coming from the public markets investments across both equities and fixed income. So Carolyn, I'd like to pose this first question to you as Lacer's advisor on asset allocation. What is NPC seeing in the markets given high inflation and high rates? And how are you addressing these factors with your client base in general? Sure. So there's a lot of folks in our industry that believe that inflation has peaked or is about to peak and roll over. And while at NEPC, we don't believe that there is any one single reliable measure of inflation that can provide clarity with exactly where inflation might be headed. But having said that, we also don't believe that inflation is heading towards double digits, and nor do we believe that it will move back down um, below 2% in the near term. So as you pointed out, one of the important components of our work with clients is asset allocation. And we always look at a portfolio sensitivity to different economic scenarios, including inflation and interest rate environments. So for years, we've include, we encouraged our clients to be really well diversified in terms of their overall portfolio. And this has also included making sure that clients have a basket of assets that have characteristics of things like pricing power, or perhaps a floating rate cash flow component to the overall portfolio, or even in some instances, shorter durations. And fortunately, I can say that our clients have heeded that advice. And so when we look back at performance over the last year or so, there have been some bright spots in portfolios, which suggests that there is some diversification in, in, in our client portfolios. But I will say we've seen an uptick in expanding real asset allocations to include strategies that might not already be present in a client's portfolio. As I think most people um, anticipate, we'll see some form of inflation in the coming years. So with higher interest rates though, and um, one of the things that we've noted is that cash 
and fixed income investments have become a whole lot more attractive than perhaps they have been over the past decade. And so going forward, we think for our clients and institutional investors and all investors, that including something like an investment grade bond allocation um, and having that and looking towards that allocation that may help clients achieve their goals and objectives um, going forward. Um, one of the big things that we are working with clients on always is their strategic allocation. Uh, and in particular, if a client hasn't reevaluated that in the last year or two, we're encouraging clients to look at their strategic allocation um, to factor in these important current market environment. Right. And, and at Lasers, we did such a study with NEPC last year in 2021. And NEPC helped us evaluate uh, potentially higher inflation, higher rate scenarios. So um, in terms of how that current market environment is affecting us, it's not really because we had already planned for it last year. Um, as it pertains to public markets, um, you know, the cu current structure of the portfolio is going to remain largely the same, and we're not really expecting to make huge changes there. Um, you know, we're not expecting to launch any manager searches in the next year or so, but as Rod had mentioned earlier, we will be going out for searches in 2024 as part of a routine contracting cycle. And that primarily affects our non-US equity bucket, which has been in place for a number of years. But you know, really the greatest challenge that we're facing today under current market conditions is aligning the portfolio with the long-term policy targets. Uh, specifically, we're challenged with aligning the current allocations to private market asset classes with the long-term targets given the decline in public market valuation. So I'd like to turn it over to Wilkin to talk about that a little bit further. Yeah, you know, thanks, Brian. You know, I think to kind of build on concerns that we're seeing as allocators, the topic that is near the top of the list for me is the denominator effect. Now, just to provide some context for the folks on the line, Lasers is currently at 18 percent of our private equity portfolio uh, relative to our 16 percent target. So that's a 2 percent overweight. We plan to deploy 850 million in calendar year 2023, but that number significantly cut back relative to what we intended to in early 2022. But the good news that Rod mentioned earlier is that we have a policy goal of committing no less than 10 percent to emerging managers, despite the slowdown of commitments. Uh, one area that we actually do have capacity to deploy capital is in the private credit space. Given that most LPs are starting off with a low numerator, that is one asset class that has been not impacted as much from the denominator effect. So realizing that the denominator issue is more prevalent in the private equity space, I'm curious to hear from consultants how you're advising your clients on how to handle this. Is this more looking at it from a longer perspective and staying the course, or do you have any pressures to make any tactical changes uh, as a result of the public markets decline in 2022. So perhaps maybe I'll start off with Jeff. Yeah, um, great question. You know, the denominator effect is is a problem across pretty much all of our clients now, given the declines in public markets and the the, the lag effect of, of private equity. You know, many of our institutional clients are overweight relative to their private equity target. Um, you know, that that said, we really do try not to focus on that too much. Um, and we try to client, you know, to, to counsel our clients to, to do the same. Um, I think we all learned from the last major recession, the, the GFC 2008, 2009 timeframe, that you really shouldn't just pull out of the market. This isn't the time to stop investing. And we counsel our clients, you know, for a truly a consistent deployment of capital over time, we, we truly believe that's the best approach. And, and I think history has taught us um, that in turbulent times, that can be the best time to, to invest in private equity. We believe private equity is uniquely suited to take advantage of these situations and these dislocations. And we believe that 2022, 2023, um, eventually could you know potentially be very good, good vintage years. So. Again, now is not the time to, to, to pull back. Um, we counsel our clients to be comfortable with, you know, maybe a range of their private equity exposure. So if it's if the target is 16, if you're 14 to 18, as long as you're in that range, you know, given the way public markets move, um, that's an okay thing. Uh, but I think the overall message is you, you need to be consistent in deploying your capital. You can't be in the market sometimes, out of the market sometimes, 
none of us are, are geniuses and none of us can actually predict what's going to happen in any given vintage year. Um, so our our council is very much to just you know deploy capital over time very consistently. Um, and we believe in that very, very deeply. Um, there are other ways if, if, if need be, you know, if, if over allocation gets too excessive, there are ways to manage that. You can do sales in the secondary market. Um, you, can, you can do other things, but um, we believe these will probably be good vintage years and we don't think anybody should be pulling back. And I think the, the good news is that most of our clients learned that lesson a decade ago and are, are sticking with that. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Felix, you know, curious getting your perspective on this uh, with real estate. Um, you know, for us, we're slightly under allocated real estate. Um, maybe you could provide some comments there. Yeah, uh, definitely. So the denominator effect is, you know, certainly felt by all of our clients, but some are in a, in a different position. So as you mentioned, Lasers is under allocated to real estate still. Um, we do have clients that have now um, have an over allocation to real estate, um, but generally, you know, if if clients are comfortable with a near-term overallocation, the recommendation is also to to stay the course, you know, maintain vintage year diversification, um, and you know see how how the private market valuations adjust. Because obviously, public markets are uh, reacting very quickly to any changes in macro environment. Private markets take a bit longer, but we do expect some near-term you know, decreases in value on private real estate as well. So some of those overallocations may you know, come down a bit naturally. Uh, but similarly to to what Jeff said, you know, it's it's important to really not sit out vintage years uh, if you don't have to. Um, overall, the the pace and the size of new capital commitments may have to adjust a bit, but our clients generally are still actively investing as well. So, looking over the next twelve to thirteen months, I think it's likely that Lacer's total portfolio will continue to to decline in valuation. And you know, what we're hearing on the private market side is that we'll continue to um, commit to funds, uh, both in private equity, private real estate, and private credit, although maybe at a slightly slower pace. Meanwhile, we're experiencing this exponential growth in the number of firms seeking to do business with Lasers. Uh, last year alone, staff took over 1,100 meetings with existing and prospective firms, primarily in the private market. So suffice to say, there's a lot of competition amongst firms for a limited amount of LASERS capital. I wanted to pose a question to Wilkin. With all of this competition and a predominant meeting request coming from private market managers, how should emerging managers best approach LASERS private markets team for meetings? And what can emerging managers do to make meetings with you and your team most effective? And conversely, what are some marketing red flags that managers should be aware of that might cause the team to think twice about prospective firms? No, it's a very relevant question, Brian. I mean, that's a struggle that my team and I are currently going through. Um, I would say first off, be patient with us. Um, I would say each one of us and my team probably get 20 to 30 requests a day uh, for meeting invites, uh, looking over uh, pitch books, uh, you know, going out to coffee. So I would definitely say that, you know, we're always still very busy with our day jobs and just be patient with us. We do see your emails and see attachments and we make note of those. And to the extent there is a fit, you know, we'll definitely get back to you if there's interest, but definitely be patient with all the, the, the inquiries that we get. Um, I would say also to research carefully our fund investments. Um, I think, you know, given that we are a public pension plan, everything is very transparent. On our website, we have our performance reports, we have our strategic plan. So, you know, I would highly recommend looking through those documents, seeing which sectors we are looking at capital uh, to deploy. Um, and that way, you kind of tailor your approach to, to your pitch. So, you know, I would say it's probably similar to like applying for a job, you know, uh, targeting uh, a cover letter that has very specific keywords as opposed to doing a generic approach. Sometimes we are, do, do, we do receive emails that are very generic, and those ones usually don't get too far given the volume of inbound inquiries that we get. Um, and once we do take a meeting, uh, I very much appreciate tra full transparency in the pitch books. I always ask for pitch books ahead of time. So that way I have an opportunity to read through everything, develop a list of questions um, for the GP meeting. And I think in the pitch book, I would say, we would recommend that the very first few pages are very explicit about the value add, similar to what Renee mentioned earlier. Um, mention what competitive edge you have relative to your peers. We're seeing, you know, in the GP side, you know, you know, numerous pitch books. Uh, how do you differentiate yourself versus the other 
uh, VC firms on Sand Hill Road. Um, in addition, I like to see a very comprehensive appendix that shows all the deals that you've done from Fund 1 to Fund 15. I realize that GPs are a, bit, a little bit reluctant to show all that information, um, but to be honest, a lot of that information does get vetted out through our consultants who go through everything with a fine-tooth comb, so eventually it comes to light anyway. Um, I, you know, again, I always like to ask questions of why certain deals didn't go the way you anticipated. We realize that given private equity, the risk inherent in this asset class, that you may have some 0.2Xs or complete write-offs. And we understand that. Uh, what I'd like to hear is what happened there, what lessons you learned, how did you course correct and pivot from that mistake? So that way we feel that you, we're, you're open with us and we feel comfortable in this long-term relationship that we're about to embark on. Right, and and from the public markets perspective, I agree with what everything with what Wilkin is saying. Well, I mentioned earlier that Lasers isn't anticipating making any changes to the public markets portfolio over the next year or so. Um, we we do plan to go out to bid for our non-U.S. equity bucket in 2024, as well as conduct another routine asset allocation study in that year, which might cause some changes to the portfolio. So in addition to the tips that Wilkin provided, I'd also re reiterate something that Renee had said in her fireside chat. And um, when you request meetings uh, with LASER staff, it's ideal if you come prepared by doing your homework on us. We have a lot of resources available for you to read through on our website. We have an excellent Emerging Manager Resources webpage that talks all about our investment uh, programs, specifically the Emerging Manager program as well as has our investment policy. You can also find our performance books on the website. And that way, when you come to the meeting, it's not really about us telling you about our program, but more about us learning from you about your firm. And that's what we're really interested in when we're evaluating opportunities. But I'd like to also ask Felix the same question because we oftentimes hear from emerging managers that it's hard to get a, a hold of the consultant. So, and we're not passing judgment on whether that's fact or embellishment. But what is the best way for emerging managers to contact Townsend? Yeah, so I, I believe at the end of this, we will also share email addresses, but we, we do have a centralized due diligence email uh, group that receives all offering materials. Uh, you can reach out to, to anyone directly as well, but that's usually where we try to uh, gather all, all manager materials. And I think some ways to you know, stand out, I mean, first of all, in, in these challenging times, you know, it's very important that uh, you are realistic uh, in your underwriting. So, you know, previous ma marketing materials will probably have to be updated to reflect the changes in market environment we've seen throughout the year. So, you know, obviously, a higher cost of debt, or changing market rent growth assumptions, changing exit cap rates. So, really show us that you do understand the, the transaction environment we are in and you know, how your return assumptions and your underwriting may change. Um, I, I also think it's a, a good time to demonstrate your ability and expertise in just nav navigating through uh, different uh, and challenging times because we, we have been on a long bull run in real estate. Uh, so really showing how you're able to navigate through this different market environment and uh, address various risks that investors are facing today is, is a, a good way to differentiate yourself. And Jeff, how about from the actual perspective? Yeah, I mean, from the Axia perspective, and again, we we will share you know email information and, and ways to to get in touch with the team, um, and and so you know feel free to take advantage of that. Um, but what I would say, you know, for my my two biggest recommendations, and and I think they've been touched on before. You know, Wilkin mentioned it, but patience uh, is certainly one. Um, we we do get a lot of inbound, you know information on on you know emerging managers and it is sometimes difficult to keep up with the flow but we are very committed to doing investments with emerging managers it's not going to be one meeting and then you get a commitment from our clients there is a there is a process that that you have to walk through um, and then renee touched on it as well i think persistence um, again, one one intro call is probably not enough for an investment. We need to to sort of do the dance and and, and walk through things. Um, it is a difficult fundraising environment. There are a lot of firms in market raising a lot of money. You've got firms that used to be raising two billion that are now raising twenty billion. We have clients with very mature portfolios. 
um, where they have you know 15 re-ups in a given year and maybe 10 spots for re-ups. Okay, great. Oh, it looks like Jeff may have frozen there, so. Um, Carolyn, do you have any comments that you can provide on this particular question? Sure. So I think there are a number of ways that um, managers can engage with NEPC. I think the easiest sometimes is to go directly to the research team member who covers your asset class. But I recognize that um, it may not be easy to get through to them or you may not know exactly who to contact. So I would encourage anyone on the call, if you don't know the right individual, you can certainly send me an email. I will try to get you to the right individual within our research team. And I will also um, maybe just say that there are times when the research team is focused on certain aspects of their asset class. So we may not be getting around to your particular type of strategy for several months. And so we'll try to give you that guidance in terms of what everyone is focused on currently and, and when we might get to that particular asset class. And then the second thing that I want to um, offer to folks is that as Renee was talking in the fireside chat, chat about having specific targets for diversity owned firms, diverse owned firms, we definitely have those targets at NEPC. Um, we've met the target that we set for ourselves several years ago, and then we moved the target further um, up the scale. And so we are looking for managers who are diverse. And our definition is slightly different than LACER's definition. So our definition is um, one of ownership. And so we're looking for minority or women owned firms greater than 50%. And that's how we categorize diverse owned. But we're also looking for diverse led firms. So you don't have to have that ownership structure, but rather the leadership structure looking at um, minorities and women that that are about 30% of your leadership structure. So those are a couple of different ways. And we have a specific website or um, email address that you can reach out to us. Um, and our, we will take a look at your materials and, and come back to you um, with some specific feedback within the next several months. So that website is diverse managers at NEPC.com. Thank you, Carolyn. So we have a few minutes left here and I, I wanna go off script and I wanna to touch upon something that Renee and Commissioner Slidley talked about in their fireside chat. And one of the things that Renee had mentioned was um, creative approaches to investing with emerging managers. So at Lacers, we have one pool of capital um, that is available to both traditional managers and emerging managers. Um, but I was curious to know if Either NEPC, Axia, or Townsend works with clients that have taken that more creative approach to uh, investing with EMs. I, I mean, I can, can jump in and say, yes, we do have clients that have specific targets um, and that they measure those targets to, to you know, get to their goals in terms of either emerging managers or diverse managers. Yeah, and I'm happy to jump in there as well. Apologies if I, if I was frozen earlier. Um, but yes, we, you know, all of our clients have an interest in emerging managers. We do believe that, you know, there is major opportunity in investing in emerging managers and growing with them over time. Um, it, every plan is different. Some have a little bit more emphasis on, on DEI. Some have a little bit more emphasis on just fund size. Um, but every client that we have ha has a, a professed interest in, in doing emerging managers and they understand the value of emerging managers over the next decade, two decades. Um, so it's, it's something that we're, we're very focused on. Yeah, I, I, I can um, really just echo that we have many different clients but uh, across the board there is a, a strong interest in emerging managers uh, we have worked with clients who have a dedicated capital pool for emerging managers so a specific program um, but we've also worked with clients you know uh, in addition to lasers who um, have one pool of capital but still try to emphasize uh, emerging managers and endeavors on managers as well great thank you for those responses as rod had mentioned earlier we're always looking for ways to um, improve our policy. So it's something that uh, for us to definitely consider. 
Um, our, our time is running short, so I'm going to conclude the panel. Um, I hope that we we're able to provide the attendees with some insights about lasers and our three consultants, NEPC, APCA, and Townsend. I want to thank our pan panelists, Carolyn, Jeff, and Felix, and my co-moderator, Wilkin, for the thoughtful discussion. Um, if, any of sorry, if any emerging managers are interested in scheduling a meeting with us, you can refer to the Emerging Manager resource page on the LACERS website. We have contact information posted on there. Um, you can go ahead and send us an email um, if you'd like to talk to us further about our program or about our policies in general. So thank you very much for your time today. And I'd now like to turn the spotlight to Neil Guglielmo, LACERS General Manager, to close the symposium. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that was a, a very insightful and informative, um, I think, panel discussion that we just had. So turning towards our closing now, I, I want to start off with a quote. Um, as Melody Hobson wrote, the biggest risk of all is not taking one. For lasers and, uh, and other public plans, um, you know, we see the talent and the results uh, that you and so many other emerging managers uh, bring to the table. And we look forward to creating those opportunities to work and grow together. Um, so some very exciting things that were, I think, discussed in, uh, in the symposium today, our third symposium. Uh, I'd like to, at this time, thank our, uh, our board president, Nilza Serrano, for her leadership and her commitment to emerging managers and to ESG and to meeting and exceeding the targets that we at LASER set for ourselves in terms of our investments program. I'd also like to thank uh, Vice President Elizabeth Lee and uh, Commissioner Sidley as well uh, for their leadership and their uh, making their time available to join us this morning as well. Uh, the entire board of LASER's commissioners uh, for their leadership in management and oversight. And then of course, to, to Rod and the entire investments team, for all the great work that they do, and of course, our uh, extremely professional consultants uh, for what they bring to the table. I'd also like to extend a heartfelt thanks uh, to our guest speaker today, uh, to Renee Griffin, for her wisdom and um, the insights that she shared in that fireside chat uh, with Commissioner Sidley. Uh, I know I learned a lot. I hope uh, the rest of uh, you all did as well. Um, and then uh, just, I think, to reiterate and highlight, uh, it's really important to reach out. Reach out to LACERS. Reach out to our, our consultants. If you'd like to do business with us, if you have questions, we have a great resource page uh, available for our Emerging Managers program on our website. But reach out, call us, send us emails. We're happy to talk to you. We look forward to working with you. And I think there's a lot of good that we can accomplish. So uh, as I close this, this morning's symposium will be posted to our website, uh, along with uh, any questions and answers um, that were addressed. And then uh, from our website, you can learn more about LASERS, uh, about our policies, uh, about the staff that we have and our programs. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, this, mo this morning for our third uh, symposium for our Merging Managers Initiative. It was uh, great to have you and look forward to um, hopefully seeing folks in person in the future, uh, but definitely join us again for our next Emerging Managers Symposium. So thank you and have a great day. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, our panelists if um, they can go ahead and turn their cameras back on so we can take a group picture as we wrap up this uh, outstanding event. I think we're good. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Great to see you all. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Great day, everyone. Thank you.